Okay, hi. Uh, the title of this lecture is Pritikin Revisited in more detail. And a couple things I'll share with you is that there's a great lecture of Nathan Pritikin on YouTube. The YouTube channel is TB1M1. I don't know what that means, but they have 6.2 hours of continuous lecture with Nathan Pritikin. And I just reread this book. I had read it 15 years ago. It's called Pritikin Program for Diet and Exercise uh, by Nathan Pritikin. It's from 1979. It's a very good book. Um, there's a lot more to this book than one would expect. He starts out by going through the history of the Pritikin program. He goes then through his biography and some case studies, then through individual foodstuffs and his perspective on them. Um, then I thought the best part of the whole book was in the back. He specifically goes through the rationale based on all the scientific literature and nutrition studies that he's uh, got, and he references them. So it was quite good. Um, when Pritikin was about 40 years of age, he was diagnosed with moderate to severe coronary artery disease based on a treadmill stress test, and he had an abnormal EKG with posterior wall ischemia. Okay, his total cholesterol was about 300. Um, he was, you know, very interested in saving his own life. He's a real bright guy. He studied the nutrition literature. Um, a couple things had a big influence on him. First of all, he had seen the World War II data during rationing. And what he found was the persons in Europe that had rationing whereby no meat or simple sugars were available to them, they had a dramatic drop in their incidence of death from myocardial infarction. So the point of that is that the psychological stress was less significant than was the change in diet. So diet is more important than psychological stress. Diet is more important than exercise. Exercise and stress are important. But diet is the most important thing for prevention of coronary artery disease. When we say coronary artery disease, we mean atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, which can plug them up and cause a myocardial infarction. Um, so that had a big impression on him. He then also went and got worked up himself uh, with Lester Morrison and then some other cardiologists. And he wanted to improve his collateral flow, so he started walking and eventually jogging in his exercise. And he recognized that he had to change his diet as he started reading about uh, atherosclerosis around the world. Um, and it's very impressive. The whole story is very interesting. He, he had spent a lot of time really going through the uh, scientific literature available to him. It took him about 11 years, but he repeated his treadmill stress test completely normal. He ran at a fast pace with a continuous heart rate of about 177 um, and not a, you know, not a trace of coronary ischemia. Uh, Dr. McDougall has said, don't even consider testing my knowledge until you've read Nathan Pritikin and Walter Kempner. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the nutrition literature. And if you want to study, let's say, English literature, you should first learn something about Greek mythology and the Bible. Okay, there's sort of like a background for a lot of stuff. If you want to study nutrition literature, you should probably first learn about Kempner, Pritikin, and McDougall. Okay, Kempner and Burkitt are kind of like Greek, Greek myths. You know, not many people know much about them. Did they really do all that stuff? Did Kempner really make money uh, with nutrition medicine for Duke University and fund the place? Um, I've read their biographies and I read some more than that. I read Burkitt's books. I tried to buy Kempner's book. I couldn't buy it. I think it's out of print. I tried to buy it. Um, Pritikin and Esselstyn are kind of like the Old Testament, very sort of inflexible in their views. No oil. Fat is bad. McDougall, Campbell, and Bernard, a little bit like the New Testament. A little salt and sugar is okay. And the story of Pritikin healing himself, McDougall's a little bit similar. Um, reminded me of the Greek myth Chiron. Chiron was the centaur that had been wounded by an arrow and then he searched for a cure for himself and as he developed his health knowledge from finding a cure for himself he then was much more able to uh, help others including he trained Asclepius the subsequent great uh, physician healer of Greeks. Okay um, there's a nice quote by Carl Jung he said only the wounded physician heals the doctor is effective only when he himself is affected the pains and burdens one bears and eventually overcomes our source of great wisdom and healing powers for others. So what I get out of that was in med school and residency, you learn the guidelines, you learn what you need to do. But when you've actually been through a health problem yourself, taking care of family members or close friends, you develop more, more and more awareness of the subtle details of it, and you get better at the process. Physicians, as long as they keep learning, they improve with age. Okay, so a couple things here that are interesting is 
Pritikin reversed his own coronary artery disease. He even volunteered his body at autopsy for, to make it public knowledge, and his coronary arteries were clean. Okay, And this is a guy who used to have moderate to severe ischemia. Um, in his Pritikin program uh, at Santa Barbara in California, he also did research. And one of the research studies he did was on cardiac catheter patients to check for coronary artery atherosclerosis reversal. And he had some patients who did reverse their cardiac casts. They previously had major stenosis and it became a minor stenosis. I think it was something like 80% went down to 30%, for example. So that's an example of cardiac cath reversal. Now, there's even physicians nowadays who say that, oh, you can't reverse coronary artery disease. That's actually not true. A coronary artery plaque contains multiple different things. And it also depends on the timing of it. When it first happens, it's more of just a pure blood clot. But the more time goes by, the more it becomes fibrosis, scar tissue. Um, the William Craig Roberts article on that is probably the best quantitative assessment of epicardial coronary arteries at necroscopy and his lectures at William C. Roberts if you're interested in the details of atherosclerotic plaque. But the point I make is the soft lipid core, we know for a fact that that can be reabsorbed. The necrotic core within an atherosclerotic plaque, that can be reabsorbed. The red blood cells, plasma membranes, and LDL that's available to the macrophages in the immune system, that can all be reabsorbed. So it can shrink a lot. Plus, one can get increased diameter of a blood vessel because the endothelium starts to function again and make a vasodilator. So the rationale is there and then the data as well. Walter Kempner showed reversal of EKG findings with his rice diet. We just discussed Nathan Pritikin showing reversal, uh, Nathan Pritikin's program showing reversal. Um, and he also had patients who dramatically improved their exercise endurance. People who previously had claudication could barely walk half a block were now out jogging and running and one of them went and did a marathon. Okay, I think that was a guy with bilateral femoral artery occlusions. Okay, next one is uh, Armstrong uh, show reversal in monkeys. You know, you feed the monkeys high fat diets, they get atherosclerosis, take the fat away, um, and they'll get some regression of their coronary artery atherosclerotic plaques. Henry Buchtwald was a physician who did uh, ileal bypasses on patients, and that was a way to, by causing malabsorption, reduce their blood cholesterols and have some regression of coronary artery disease. Blankenhorn uh, did his study in the femoral arteries, again, showing some reversal of atherosclerotic disease. Uh, Dean Ornish did a very famous study that was published in The Lancet on reversal of coronary artery disease upon uh, taking on a vegetarian diet with reversal on spec scans of the, of the heart. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn showed reversal of coronary artery disease in some of his patients at cardiac cath. And other cardiologists and MDs have subsequently seen this happen in patients. And lots of patients who've gone to a vegan diet in particular have had evidences of improved coronary artery functions. Uh, some have had reversals of erectile dysfunction, which is usually caused by the same thing, atherosclerosis. Okay, another thing that was very interesting was um, Nathan Pritikin spoke about calcium. And so lots of people worry about their calcium for osteoporosis, postmenopausal women. And he gave a great epidemiology. Epidemiology is often like the most helpful thing because things become more obvious. So in the Bantu women in Africa, they typically have an average daily calcium intake of 350 milligrams per day. And that's about the same amount as one glass of milk. Um, the USRDA for calcium is about 1,200 milligrams per day. Um, so about you know, four times that almost. And that's for a woman of reproductive age. The Bantu women, on average, have about nine children, and they typically breastfeed for about two years. Um, and the Bantu woman in her adult life eats and drinks no dairy, okay? But they don't have any problem with osteoporosis. So that's the point. They have this minimal calcium intake. And despite the calcium burden, so to speak, of you know donating calcium to one's baby in utero and breastfeeding, to, which includes some calcium being put into the breast milk, uh, they don't have any problem with osteoporosis. The gut's good at absorbing what it needs. And so the point is, do women really need calcium supplements? Uh, the thought, the more up-to-date thought is probably not, that it can even increase all-cause mortality because it's thought that it might induce a transient uh, prothrombotic phase in the blood when that bolus comes through uh, the calcium absorbed from the gut into the blood it contributes to the clotting factors. Um, on the other hand, if you just check the blood after a midnight fast, for example, it'll be normal. So it's not something that's a persistent finding. Uh, so that's a little bit on calcium intake. That's kind of interesting.
Okay, uh, real quick, what was the, the Nathan Pritikin diet? Um, it was predominantly vegetarian diet, starch-based, does allow a little bit of meat and dairy. I have a feeling that a lot of people, they grew up eating meat and dairy. It seems like a normal thing. They were conditioned to think those were good foods, so it takes time to let go of them. This book here, and again, it's a great book, Pritikin Program, and it was written in 1979. Um, over time, a person will often progressively let go of the meat and the dairy as they learn more about it and they don't want anything to do with it. Um, so the Pritikin diet still allowed a little bit. In part, he said, because it provided B12, but of course a person can supplement with B12. Um, and the goals of the diet were to end up with about 10% fat, about 15% or less on protein, and about 75% of complex carbohy of carbohydrates, predominantly complex carbohydrates. Um, and so, you know, we'll come back to it, but it's hard to get only 10% fat if you're eating any meat because meat has tons of fat. Um, avoid processed foods, all processed foods, uh, no oils, no sweets, no caffeine, no coffee, no tea. It's because the caffeine elevates blood pressure, blood fatty acids, blood glucose, increases the risk of gastroesophageal reflux disease. No alcohol either in the Pritikin program. Um, this is the Pritikin program as of 1979 is what I'm talking about here. Um, alcohol predisposes a person to fatty liver. It'll sludge the red blood cells into a low formation. It's a two-carbon unit ethyl alcohol, and a lot of it gets made into um, like acetyl-CoA in the liver, and that'll then subsequently sometimes just be made into uh, saturated fat like palmitate, palmitic acid, C16, no double bonds. Um, it'll also increase platelet stickiness. It's a, a bit of an immune suppressant. Increases cancer risk. There's nothing good about alcohol. I recommend don't even drink it at all, zero. Um, no nuts except chestnuts. And, and by the way, what I, why do I say that about alcohol? This is my opinion. Because I think the antithrombotic effect is overrated, exaggerated for just one or two drinks. And it does, it is a brain toxin. It's how we sterilize the skin. We're doing a blood draw, for example. And I just think it's overrated. You don't need it for anything. And there's, there's always some catch with alcohol. You're pouring that tumor promoter right over your mouth. That's a terrible spot to get a cancer. Okay, no nuts except chestnuts because chestnuts are really low in fat. The other nuts are high in fat. And in general, one of the biggest things he emphasizes throughout is lowering one's fat intake. Um, try to walk at least twice a day for 30 minutes or more each time. Exercise is real important. I believe it's real important because you clear out the extracellular matrix by increasing lymphatic flow 10 to 30 fold. Um, and he just said, you know, sort of the body is a user or lose its system. And if you don't keep exercising, your body gets pro progressively lazier and fatigued. And you'll lose the capacity over time. Um, he limited sodium to 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams a day, which I think is too high. He was a big believer that fat was a more important cause of hypertension than is sodium. Uh, I'm not so sure I agree with that. I would keep sodium lower. The Yanomamo only eat 200 milligrams a day of sodium. Kempner had some patients as low as 150 milligrams a day for his control of hypertension. Uh, he recommends limiting beans to only once to three times per week. The reason he did that is because he, beans are high in protein. They're about 25% protein. And because of that, if you're eating them every day, you know, you, it'll take a little more effort to keep your total protein intake below 15. Me personally, I like eating beans. I eat them quite often, but I try to mix them a lot with something uh, lower in protein. For example, with rice, or I'll eat a lot of fruit that day. Okay, Nathan Pritikin, sort of, he's famous for saying fat is bad. And the reason for that is the more one studies fat, the more one sees problems related to fat. The main concern is Rouleau hypoxia, whereby the fat, especially through increasing LDL cholesterol, causes the red blood cells to stick together. It's true not just of saturated fat, but of other types of fat as well. Um, Roy Swank is the famous neurologist who did all the work on multiple sclerosis and he had the nice pictures of the hamster cheek pouch where one could view. He's got that nice video. It's available through drmcdougall.com's website of high fat meal with blood sludge. And they've shown the same thing. They've shown it under the tongue. They've shown it in the eyes. A high fat meal causes sludging of the red blood cells, which drops oxygen delivery to the tissues. Peter Quo did some nice work in the 1950s and 60s, including where he took a bunch of cardiac angina patients and uh, followed their blood lipids every 30 minutes and found postprandially, uh, that means just after eating, about five hours they had peak lipemia, and that's when they also had cardiac angina, and that would persist until about eight hours uh, or nine hours. With arterial occlusions in the eye, 
That was seen from sat fat uh, rouleau formation at three to nine hours postprandial by Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman. And they also then took patients after having eaten unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fats became kind of popular in the 1960s as an alternative to saturated fat, but they still caused just as much atherosclerosis. Um, and what they found was that, uh, Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman was that, even when they gave them unsaturated fat, uh, it would persist even longer the rouleau formation beyond nine hours. So uh, fat just makes all the things stick together, like when you deal with it in the kitchen, it's a mess, the oils and whatnot. Inducing insulin resistance. Uh, you've all heard about the Sweeney paper, the Hemsworth papers. The bottom line is fat increases insulin resistance, predisposes uh, diabetes and fatty liver. Uh, fat's also bad because it increases the risk of cancer. The more fat a person needs, the higher their risk of cancer for breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. A high-fat diet causes up to 10 times increase in the amount of bile acid secreted from the liver and the gallbladder. And this eventually leads to more colon bacteria being anaerobic. You get a negative type of gut flora. You get more secondary bile salts. Their primary bile salts sit around in the colon. They get converted by the bacteria to secondary bile salts, and they're potentially carcinogenic. Okay, another thing as well, some people say, well, don't you need your good fats? How are you going to get enough omega-6, omega-3s? And the point is, you actually need more omega-6s than you do omega-3s. And one bowl of oatmeal, 100 grams, will give you all the omega-6 linoleic. It's the precursor essential fatty acid uh, that you need. It's C18-2, meaning 18 carbons, two double bonds. So it turns out to be pretty easy to meet those demands. There was a guy by the name of Winnitz who took a bunch of patients with a chemically defined diet and he fed them just 0.7% linoleic acid, C18, uh, two double bonds, omega-6 position, uh, to meet their fat needs, and that was plenty adequate. And there's other persons who've re, re, uh, confirmed that study. McKean's one of them. And so the point is, and here it is said by Nathan Pritikin, there's no such thing as a fat-deficient diet um, when a person's eating naturally occurring food. So that's the least of your worries should be to, to get more fat. You don't need it. The average person doesn't need it. Okay. Uh, simple sugars are bad. The human body's not made for simple sugar. Simple sugars, when, let's say, you drink a sweetened drink, and there's nothing in nature like that where you can drink, you know, 16 ounces of a really sweetened beverage. Your blood glucose spikes, and when your blood glucose spikes, the insulin tends to overcompensate, drive it down too low, and you get rebound hypoglycemia. And if it's real severe, that could be significant, have a negative effect on the brain, but it's especially significant if you're simultaneously eating a meal with a lot of, uh, stimulants like if you're, if you're smoking a cigarette got the nicotine you're drinking caffeinated beverage you got the caffeine as a stimulant uh, if the food contains MSG and aspartate aspartame those are two stimulants so now you run the danger of ramping up your metabolic demands of your hippocampal neurons because of all these stimulants while simultaneously potentially dropping the blood supply if you eat a high fat meal dropping the blood supply due to vasoconstriction if there's a lot of sodium in there um, or dropping the oxygen, I'm sorry, dropping the glucose supply because of rebound hypoglycemia. The relevance is it takes tons of energy to pump out excessive intracellular cytoplasm calcium uh, due to excitotoxins. And if you don't have the blood glucose available or oxygen available, you're gonna have a hard time pumping out that calcium and that can lead to overstimulation of a neuron. It fires too many action potentials and the neuron dies. That's called excitotoxicity. The best food for humans in general to satisfy hunger is starch because it's a complex carbohydrate and the fiber has to be peeled off by the gut and then get this slow absorption, like a slow release energy pill, sending about two calories per minute in the, from the gut into the blood. And that's perfect for the human body, a continuous steady energy supply. Um, and the body's very good at handling that. So Nathan Pritikin figured out an amazing amount of stuff way back in the 1970s that most people don't know nowadays, 2020. Okay, um, is 10% protein enough in one's diet? Because that's a thing, common thing that persons who don't know much about nutrition are going to ask you. And the Tarahumata in northern Mexico, they got separated from the Pima in 1848, Mexican-American War, and okay, they stayed in northern Mexico. They don't even have cars. They run around everything they do. They eat a typical vegetarian diet approximately in terms of its number, 80-10-10 diet. A lot of corn, peas, squash, local greens and fruits. Um, and they have like next to zero obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, or coronary disease. 
They have incredible endurance. They can run 100 miles in three days carrying a 100-pound pack. They play a game where the goalposts are like about 175 miles apart. And so they're perfectly capable of running a couple hundred miles in a few days. Um, in comparison, the Pima population, demographically matched, you know, 100-something years ago, they live in Arizona now, eat the standard American diet, tons of obesity, diabetes, gallstones, coronary artery disease. So there's really no escape. If you're eating processed food and meat, you know, you're going to get coronary artery occlusions and you're going to probably be, the majority of the persons doing them, they're going to be fat and sick. Okay, one just quick point is he, Nathan Pritikin has been asked, well, what diet does he recommend for children or pregnant women? Should they have a different diet? He says, no, they can eat more food relative to their body weight if they're, if they're hungry, but these, he recommends the exact same diet for all of them. And that's part of the internal consistency of vegan diet is you look at it 10 different ways, it still works. Uh, one brief point, you know, at the Pritikin program, they don't allow patients to smoke at all. A lot of people used to smoke back in the 1960s and 70s because as we spoke about, nicotine is a stimulant, but more importantly, carbon monoxide is dropping the oxygenation. So you can see how if you're simultaneously smoking, you're dropping the oxygen perfusion pressure of the tissues because you've got carbon monoxide dropping the oxygen getting to the tissue. If you eat a high fat meal simultaneously, the low fat blood sludge um, is dropping the oxygen uh, supply to the tissues. And when you have multiple different things going on, like you're simultaneously giving stimulants where the tissues need more oxygen and glucose, and in the meantime, you're dropping the oxygen and glucose delivery to them, those neurons are at high risk to die from apoptosis, programmed cell death due to lack of uh, nutrients or oxygen. Okay, um, yeah, so cigarettes are terrible for a person. The other thing, too, is they really make a person age quickly. You can see a smoker over 40. You can tell them from, you know, 30 yards. They got this sucked-in, wrinkled face. Um, and I've seen girls that were real pretty smoking a lot of cigarettes. They lose their looks very fast. So not a smart thing to do, not an attractive thing to do. Another thing interesting, and again, this is all stuff pretty pr new back in the 1970s, was lung cancer patients um, have a much higher risk of getting lung cancer if they simultaneously have a high blood cholesterol. Like in Japan and other areas, there were tons of people who smoked, but because they had a healthier diet, they usually would not get lung cancer. So that's kind of interesting. High-fat diet, synergistic to promote uh, cancer formation. Okay, is there anything I disagree with uh, with Pritikin? Well, like I said, I think he was kind of figuring everything out as he went along, and he allowed animal products. I personally think that's a mistake, and, you know, McDougal doesn't, Esselstyn doesn't, T. Colin Campbell, they all recommend zero. Neil Bernard, they all recommend zero animal products. Um, and my thought was be, it'd be hard to keep your dietary fat at 5 to 10% um, and your protein at 15% or less if you're allowing any animal products. And now, again, too, with what we know, you'd want your animal protein to be lower, 10% or lower if you could. Um, when you eat animal products, there's a tendency to overeat. Um, the other thing, too, is he, I think he allowed too much salt. He would allow his patients up to 3 to 4 grams per day. That's too much. Like I said, Yanomama, only 200 milligrams per day, and... Uh, Dr. Walter Kempner wouldn't allow his patients to eat that much. Some of his patients were as low as like 150 milligrams a day. Uh, like Dr. McDougall, what does he say about salt? He says, let them put a little salt on their food or the, otherwise they won't eat it. So yeah, a lot of people are very obsessed with taste. And don't worry, you want your food to taste good, but you don't want that to be a higher priority than your health. I like the food, the taste of vegan food. Okay, more Pritikin insights. The standard American diet is about 40% fat, 20% simple sugars, and they both have next to zero nutrients in them. Flour is often another 15% of calories. So if you total that up, you've got 75% of your calories coming from food that has almost zero nutrition value, even potentially negative nutrition value. Okay, here's an example of comparing some foods. And one can see here that hamburger and all the other meats, they're all very fat. The lowest fat percentage was 30%, which is still very high. And there's no carbohydrate in meat. So if whatever your fat is, by definition, your meat makes up the rest of the 100%. So even if you eat lean beef, you're still going to get 70% fat. Um, then you look at these other foods here. For example, I put the potato all in green because it's like the perfect food. Only 1% fat. Remember, it's impossible to be too low in fat. 
only 1% fat. That's exactly like what you want. That's like perfect. And protein is also quite low at eight. Perfect. Um, that way you're not, you're not eating more of something than what you need. Um, apples, again, got a great metabolic profile. Um, bananas, blueberries, great metabolic profiles. Okay, I included some references here if anybody's curious, you know, like we spoke about regression of coronary artery atherosclerotic disease in monkeys, the significance of carbon monoxide in smokers contributing to the ischemia due to um, rouleau formation with a high fat meal, the rate of atherosclerosis changed during treatment of hyperlipidemia, uh, Blank, Blankenhorn study in 1978, um, effect of saturated fats on lipemia, conjunctival circulation, the great Friedman and Rosenman experiments. Goldblatt's work was somewhat similar to Warburg, inducing malignancy in rat subjects. So there's a couple more references there if anybody's interested. Hope this was helpful.